Medieval Beijing was defended by 900 towers, four great castles and a wall stretching almost 18 miles. Why then, in 1214, was it defeated by a group of nomadic horsemen from the steppe? Find out in today's episode of the History Chronicles. In the 13th century, the Jin Dynasty had obtained an empire that stretched across the northeast region of modern-day China. The Jin Emperor governed an area that made its money through an abundance of rich farmland, and, just as importantly, the trade of lucrative silk. Its capital was Beijing, or, to give it its Chinese name at this time, Zhongdu, and I'll be using that name throughout the rest of the video. Zhongdu was a hub for commercial activity. In the context of the 12th century, the city was a veritable metropolis, home to a population of thousands. It was here that the emperor ruled his millions of peasants, eking out a living on farmland that was defended by further fortified cities across the region. However, the Jin dynasty was still relatively young, and its origins were, in fact, like the Mongols, nomadic. The Jin had emerged as the victors of a series of conflicts a century earlier, and now established themselves as a settled presence in northeast China. By the time of our story in 1200, they had seemingly all but forgotten their nomadic roots. By the time of our story in 1200, they had seemingly all but forgotten their nomadic roots. Their power now was not centred around the grasslands of the steppe, but based around the fortified cities, the strongest of which was Zhongdu. It was on the borderlands of the Jin Empire that trouble began to stir. For decades, a semblance of security had been kept in this region by the Empire's use of client warlords. These men gained the support and access to the lucrative trade in silk and other precious goods in return for managing, and often fighting off, nomadic raiders from the steppe. If you listen to my video on the rise of Chinggis Khan, you will hear that one of the Khan's first allies, Togril, was one such client warlord, known as a Wang Khan. To the west, the Jin maintained a sometimes fractious but stable relationship with the empire of the Zhijia, situated across the Yellow River. So far, this had prevented the empire from coming under serious attack from the people of the steppe, but, as we shall see, it had also engendered a level of complacency. The emperor now appeared to regard the nomadic people as barbaric, and as such, of minimal concern. This attitude had some justification. After all, the Mongol tribes were always at each other's throats, and they had very little experience of siege warfare, the type of warfare that would be required if they were to take over cities such as Zhongdu. But in 1209, the empire of the Zhijia to the west of the Jin had been rocked by a huge invasion. Thousands of horsemen had marched 500 kilometres through the Gobi Desert, seemingly without issue, and had laid siege to the Zhijia city of Volokai. For a nomadic raid, such a move was unheard of. Usually, horsemen from the steppe had avoided direct attacks on cities such as this. Horses did not stand up well to walls and towers, after all. But this invasion force was different. Its leader was Chinggis Khan, a warlord from the steppe who had, by 1209, united the Mongol tribes following the years of violent tribal warfare between them. With this success behind him, Chinggis now employed the full military force of the Mongolian steppe against its neighbours. The results were catastrophic for the Zhijia. In taking the city of Volokai, Chinggis Khan first surrounded the city and demanded 10,000 birds and 1,000 cats from the garrison's commander. A strange request, you might think, but one that was to make sense if you listen. Thinking that the besieging army would now leave, this wish was granted by the commander. What the Mongols did next was cleverly to set fire to the tails of these animals and unleash them back into the city. Chaos ensued in this hot and dry summer, in an age when housing consisted of cloth, baked mud and straw. An inferno resulted and wreaked havoc in the city. In the confusion, the Mongol army looted what remained. Mongol ingenuity was also demonstrated in the way that the Mongols made their way to the Zhijia capital, the city of Ningjia. Chinggis Khan set up his army to lay siege to the city, but then appeared to retreat. Seeing a chance for victory, the city's commander sallied forth from the walls in an attempt to rout the Mongols. But the retreat was a feint. Chinggis's army doubled back and crushed the commander's forces, capturing the garrison commander himself. Success did not always come so easily, however. Although the Mongols had crushed the bulk of the Zhijia army, they were as yet unable to break through the walls of its capital. They built a dam on the Yellow River and tried to flood the city out. But due to poor engineering, the dam collapsed and the plan failed. Siege warfare remained a nut for the Mongols that was yet to be cracked. Nevertheless, the destruction of his army was enough to bring the Zhijia king to terms. 
he now offered the Mongols silk, camels, military support, and to Chinggis Khan, his daughter. Chinggis accepted. With the Zhijia as allies, Chinggis could now set his sights even further to the east, to the territory of the Jin. In the year 1210, Chinggis held a council called the Kulitai that was to gather a huge army for a grand new campaign against the Jin Empire. Soldiers were demanded from all of the Mongol tribes and the newly conquered territories of the Zhijia. Those who did not send military support were threatened with extinction by the Khan himself. This campaign was to be a risky one. Never before had a force of nomads embarked on such a large-scale enterprise. Indeed, Chinggis himself spent three days in the mountains, consulting with the Mongolian god of the sky, Tengri, before he set off east. The army set off in March 1211, advancing across two fronts with as many as 100,000 men. With him, Chinggis had his trusty generals, Jebe and Subadai. The use of loyal, experienced fighting men was to be a recurring feature of Chinggis's campaigns and success. These were men with ordinary soldierly backgrounds. They had earned their wealth and respect through warfare, and, like Chinggis, had led soldiers into battle many a time before this campaign. The Mongol army broke into two, each with different objectives. Chinggis led one part of the army to capture territory around the Jin city of Daitong. Another of his generals, Mughali, with Jebe and Subadai, led a simultaneous expedition with a force that was to keep the Jin on the defensive. Jebe particularly distinguished himself in this campaign, again making use of the feigned retreat, and even having his soldiers play dead, to lead the forces of the Jin into an ambush. The Jin had massive forces at their disposal. Recruitment for the army could take place among a population numbering almost 20 million. Like Chinggis Khan, the Jin Emperor also employed other tribal groups to boost his military strength. Jurchen horsemen, Kiturns and Onguts all contributed to a military force of 500,000 foot soldiers in total. This was in addition to 120,000 men on horseback. Although this numerical strength was greater than that of the Mongols, it was more fragile. The large number of tribes involved lacked the unifying figurehead enjoyed by the Mongols in Chinggis Khan. This problem was perhaps exacerbated by the fact that nomadic horsemen from the north were seen as barbaric and harmless. The real threat perceived by the Jin was that of the Song Dynasty, a rival power situated to their south in modern-day China. An invasion from the north was both unprecedented and unexpected. When faced with the Mongol invasion of 1211, the Jin forces began to crumble almost immediately. Chinggis held secret negotiations with the Khitan tribe, and was able to prize many of them from their loyalty to the Jin Emperor. Similarly, the Ongut tribe quickly turned against the Jin in the face of the Mongol conquerors. The victories in the 1211 campaign also saw a large number of the Jin infantry and even siege engineers, which was to become important later, defect to the army of Chinggis. This was crucial, for the influx of Chinese expertise in siege warfare was to aid the Mongols in overcoming one of their chief difficulties, how to take a city. The Mongol army arrived at the walls of Zhongdu in September 1211. The Jin army had been defeated, but their dynasty survived hiding behind the huge, hulking defences of their capital. The Mongol campaign had so far been a success, but capturing the city was to prove too much for Chinggis' army just yet. Chinggis sent his general Jebe on a campaign north to present-day Manchuria, then he retreated back to his Mongol homeland. Even in their withdrawal, the Jin were to feel the brutality of the Mongol army. Chinggis sent raiding parties in his retreat to ravage Jin farmland, resulting in famine for many of its people. Interestingly though, this slaughter of the Jin was not systematic, and Chinggis left no garrison in Jin territory. He was still very much the nomadic raider. The Jin were able to regroup and rebuild the following year. 1212 saw a new invasion. This time though, the route by which the Mongols had entered Jin territory, the Joyung Pass, had been heavily fortified. The Jin were now ready and waiting. They were not to make the mistake of underestimating their nomadic adversaries again. But here, Chinggis was to demonstrate once again his resourcefulness as a leader. Chinggis had secured relations with a Muslim merchant, Jafar, who knew the mountain passes well. Jafar could thus carefully guide Mongol forces through an alternative route. With this advantage, the Mongols launched a surprise attack on the Jin in the pass. They slaughtered the army to a man. The local warlord, a Jurchin prince who had been a client of the Jin Emperor, now defected to the Mongols. But this success was to be short-lived. As in 1211, the Mongols pressed into the heartlands of Jin territory, but again, the challenge of capturing their enemy's cities proved too much to overcome. The army laid siege to the Jin city of Daitong. 
However, in the skirmishes that ensued, Chinggis Khan himself was injured. With their leader out of action, the Mongol forces again returned home for the year. Another Mongol invasion followed in 1213 with a similar story, swift conquest coming to an abrupt halt as soon as the Mongols came up against the city. However, with each incursion into Jin territory, the Mongols were gaining knowledge and experience of siege warfare. The strength of the Mongol army continued to be bolstered as infantry and more siege engineers defected to join the ranks of Chinggis Khan. In the spring of 1214, a campaign against the Jin was launched yet again. Swiftly, the Mongols arrived at and laid siege to the towering walls of the city of Zhongdu, the Jin capital. By this point, the Mongols controlled the land north of the Yellow River and were in their strongest position yet. Even when disease shook the Mongol camp, they refused to retreat. It seemed that this time, things were different. Inside the city's walls, Chinggis had heard that the Jin Emperor had been replaced in a coup by a puppet ruler, leaving a Jin general in tentative control of the army. The Khan sent an ultimatum to the new ruler which was soon accepted. He was to submit to the Mongols, give up his imperial title, and accept instead the position of King of Henan. Tribute was arranged and sent to the Mongol camp. 3,000 horses, cartloads of gold and silk, and, sadly, 1,000 boys and girls among which was the emperor's daughter herself, who was sent directly to Chinggis Khan. With this, the Mongol army lifted their siege and prepared for the long journey home. All was well, until a new message reached Chinggis's ears. The Jin emperor had not remained in Zhongdu. He had instead fled south to the city of Kaifeng. From here, he could again rally the Jin against the Mongols and break the terms that were agreed at Zhongdu. Chinggis was enraged. He ordered his main army back, taking with him his generals Mughali and Subadai. The Mongols marched south and laid siege to Kaifeng in an attempt to catch the emperor. A Jin relief force was defeated, with yet more soldiers defecting to the Mongols. Mughali was sent east to Korea, where further conquests gained the submission of the Korean court and a pledge of allegiance to the Mongols. Capture of the Korean peninsula in this campaign was to give the Mongols a vital base where they could graze their horses and restore their troops while they carried on fighting against the Jin. Similarly, Jebe's success in Manchuria took an area rich in resources from the Jin and placed it firmly in Mongol hands. In March 1215, both generals, Jebe and Mughali, joined their commander at the walls of Zhongdu. The city was enveloped by the Mongol army with thousands of soldiers, many of whom had defected from the Jin over the course of the preceding three years of war. With their new experience in siege warfare, the Mongols were now able to capture one of the forts that defended the city. The Jin army that was sent from Kaifeng to relieve the city was crushed. Such was the desperation of the Jin defenders that one general committed suicide before falling victim to the Mongol onslaught. In the chaos that ensued, the Mongols broke through the walls. What resulted was the sack of Zhongdu. The Mongols slaughtered thousands inside the city, looting at will, with captured treasure being placed into carts bound for the army's return to Mongolia. According to the Mongol secret history, 60,000 women in Zhongdu committed suicide rather than succumb to rape by the Mongol hordes. Fires lasted for over a month. The Mongols were only to disperse when the smell of death became too much. The devastation of the Jin Empire did not end there. As they returned home, the Mongol army continued to burn the crops of those that they had conquered. In all, this left thousands of refugees in a famine that was to last for years. 1216 saw the final invasion of the Jin Empire by Chinggis Khan. The victorious Khan was to turn his attention elsewhere following the great fall of Zhongdu. However, what the Mongols had learned in the Jin territories they took with them to later campaigns. The ability to capture cities and garrison areas of territory were significant changes to the continuous motion of the Mongols' nomadic past. As such, the conquest of the Jin Empire was to be a proving ground for further expansion to come. With Chinese siege techniques and experience, the Mongols were to claim territory that stretched far beyond the Yellow River, into the far reaches of Central Asia. These nomadic warriors fighting on horseback were fast becoming the soldiers of a new grand Mongol Empire. Thank you for watching today's episode of the History Chronicles. I very much hope you've enjoyed it as usual. Please do like and subscribe. Check out our Patreon page below to support the channel. And I look forward to seeing you again soon for more History Chronicles.